Hello everyone, welcome to Ask Concussion Doc, and today we are going to be talking about the top treatments for concussion. So this is a two-part series. Last week we spoke about the causes of persistent concussion symptoms or prolonged concussion symptoms as they are now referred to. And this week we're going to be talking about the top treatments for concussion. My name is Dr. Cameron Marshall. I am the host of Ask Concussion Doc. I'm the founder of Complete Concussion Management, which is the largest concussion network uh, in the world. We have about 450 clinic locations. I also, last year, founded a program called the Concussion Fix uh, with myself, a psychotherapist, Melinda Crinan hill as well as a naturopathic doctor, Dr. Paul Herkel. And in this, this episode of the Top Treatments for Concussion, we're going to talk about the evidence-based treatments for concussion. And the beautiful thing about this is that all of these things are not only based on the evidence, but a lot of them uh, don't require any fancy tools or fancy treatments, okay? So this is the most important thing to understand is that concussion recovery does not require you to spend thousands of dollars to go to expensive and fancy clinics to do treatments like hyperbaric oxygen and laser therapy and all of this other stuff. There's no evidence to support these types of therapies. And so the actual evidence-based treatment for concussion, and yes, concussion is treatable. So for all of you people that think that there is no treatment for concussion, you are using very outdated information. Actually, I just had somebody comment on one of my Facebook posts saying that my doctor told me to go home and do nothing. There was no treatment for concussion. And so there is a treatment and hopefully this clears the air for you because I'm gonna dive into all of the research around this and show you study after study after study on the various treatment programs and strategies that can be useful for treating patients with post-concussion syndrome, persistent concussion symptoms, prolonged concussion symptoms, whatever you want to call it. Basically, if you've had a concussion and you're still symptomatic two weeks later, you should be doing some type of intervention in order to help speed that recovery. If you don't, you will still be suffering weeks to months to years later. So that's an important distinction to make is that although these treatments are going to be discussed around persistent or prolonged concussion symptoms. They are the exact same treatments that will also prevent persistent concussion symptoms if you do them early on. Okay? So let's get going on that. All right? So treatment is pretty simple, actually, and I'm going to break everything down. Although I say it's simple, it is not easy. Okay, and that's something I want to get across as well is that although the strategy is quite simple, right, we know what the causes are. And if you haven't listened to last week's episode, please go back and do that because that will frame out the causes. Once we know the causes, we can start putting together the pieces for why the treatments actually work. And it all makes sense. It's simple, but it takes hard work. It takes dedication and it takes commitment every single day. You have to kind of make this, it's, it's changes in lifestyle. It's not just, oh, I'm going to go to see you and, I, and you're going to get me better in a week. No, that doesn't work, right? These week-long intensives, going to various you know practitioners that you think they're going to cure you in a week, it's not how it works, okay? Concussion recovery has to have a bit of a lifestyle change in how you eat, how you sleep, how you exercise, how you think, everything, okay? And we're going to break it down. Okay, so we're going to do a quick review of last week. So if you did miss it, we will do a quick review. But if you did miss it, go back and check it out because we go much more in depth in the stuff that we talked about in terms of the five causes of persistent concussion symptoms. And then we're going to go into treatment. As I mentioned, that these treatments can also be used early on in concussion recovery and can actually prevent you from having a long standing outcome. Generally, at complete concussion management clinics, we start these treatments within five to 10 days after injury. So early on can be preventative and we've shown this the general population if you read the scientific literature between 30 and 40 percent of patients will go on to have symptoms lasting longer than a month at ccmi clinics at our clinics because we implement this stuff early less than five percent of patients have symptoms after a month we're seven to eight times better than what you would expect in normal care just because we use the evidence in our practices 
to initiate this. So if you've just had a concussion, find a complete concussion management clinic. It's the best thing you can do because they've all been trained in how to do this and they'll help to guide you through this process. Okay, here we go. So acute concussion, remember what this creates is an energy deficit, okay? Ten, um, it's, it's a 30 day kind of process, right? So you get this stretching, shearing, you go through this energy deficit, you end up, you know, about 30 days later, the energy deficit is gone, okay? And we, then we talked about, well, why do you still have symptoms beyond that 30-day timeline, okay? That's kind of the cutoff for PCS. But like I said, these treatments should be started much earlier than 30 days so that we can actually prevent this from happening, okay? Now, PCS, or persistent pro prolonged concussion symptoms, are defined as basically beyond that 30 days. So if you have a concussion, you go through this energy deficit, you recover from that energy deficit, but you're still symptomatic. So what's going on inside the brain actually is no longer attributed to that energy deficit. So it's something else. So the five causes that of things that could be going on, number one is autonomic dysregulation. So your autonomic nervous system. This can create blood flow abnormalities and all sorts of other things. And we'll talk a bit about that. Number two is inflammation. Anytime you get a uh, uh, an injury to the brain, you're going to get inflammation within the nervous system. Inflammation in the nervous system is very hard to turn off. Once you've kickstarted an inflammatory process, it's very hard to turn that off. Okay, You get what's called microglial priming, where the inflammatory cells of your central nervous system are on edge. And it's very difficult to turn them off. And if you have chronic inflammation within your brain, that's usually attributed to issues with your gut. But any little kind of bump or jolt can trigger another response and also it can create fogginess, uh, mental health problems, anxiety, depression, um, inability to think clearly, cognitive problems, all of these different things can be related to chronic or systemic inflammation. Hormone dysregulation is lumped into that as well because if this happens for a long enough period of time, your hormones can actually get dysregulated. Also, your pituitary gland, which is kind of your hormone center, it's sitting in a very precarious spot within the brain and often will get damaged during the injury itself. And then over time, the, dis the dysfunction starts to cause some of the long-term or persistent symptoms, okay? Number three, visual and vestibular dysfunction. Your visual system is about 50% of your brain. So your brain is involved in about 50% of visual processing and all the information that's coming in through your eyes. So it makes sense that some of these dysfunctions may linger. Vestibular dysfunction is lumped into that because it's very difficult to tell what's visual, what's vestibular. Number four is the cervical spine, so your neck. Your neck is injured at the same time you get a concussion, and the symptoms of whiplash and neck injury or neck dysfunction are the same as concussion. Headaches, dizziness, nauseousness, mental you know, health problems, uh, balance impairments, you, you name it concussion and whiplash are identical. So they're caused by the same thing, acceleration, deceleration, and they result in the same symptoms. So oftentimes if you have an underlying neck issue that's never been addressed, you think it's concussion or brain injury, but it's not. It's actually a neck issue. And if you were just to treat the neck issue, you'd actually get better. But most clinicians don't know this. So they keep hammering on the fact that they think you have brain damage, but you actually don't. All right. And then number five is the psychological, the mental health side of things, misattribution of symptoms, the good old days, bias, anxiety, depression, etc. PTSD. We talked about this last week. So if you want a review of that and, and what those mechanisms are, please go back and check out last week's episode because then this week will make a lot more sense to you. All right. Okay. So all of these things, every single one of them is treatable. And here's the thing. People assume that a concussion causes brain damage. And then if you're still having symptoms, it means that your brain is damaged and you have ongoing brain damage. But so far the consensus is that the symptoms are not due to anything to do with ongoing brain damage. They are due to other physiological things that happen as a result of the concussion injury. And it kind of reflects your health going into it. So if you had, let's say, gut dysbiosis or issues of chronic inflammation prior to injury, this is going to exacerbate these, okay? So this is kind of a reflection of potentially your pre-injury status. If you had pre-injury mental health issues, anxiety, depression, and you get a concussion, it'll likely exacerbate those issues and also create a barrier to recovery. So it's important to think of this as a multi-system, multifaceted issue. This is not just about brain. 
And when I say we're going to treat concussion, concussion treats itself. Concussion, the injury itself is a short term thing. It goes away very short term, right? It's a 30 day, three to six week process. It's the other issues that happen that can cause the lingering symptoms. Okay, so that's very important to understand. Find your cause and you've basically been able to find your treatment. Okay, so let's talk about treatment. Here's where most people go wrong. Concussion is very trial and error. You get a concussion. You go to your GP. You may go to the emergency department, right? They're going to do a CT scan and all sorts of other things. And they're basically just trying to make sure that you're not going to die. When they do a CT scan and all this other imaging, they're looking for things like bleeds, right? Hemorrhaging, brain damage. Do we see actual damage within the brain? No, we don't then okay you're fine to go home ct scan was normal everybody's okay they'll send you home with very little instruction okay they might even tell you oh we, your ct scan is clean and they might even infer that that means you don't have a concussion that's not how it works you can't see a concussion in those imaging modalities the reason they do them is simply to make sure there isn't something more serious going on and then what happens well you may follow up with your family doctor your family doctor may say, okay, well, just take two weeks and do nothing, right? Don't go to work. Don't do anything. Don't talk on the phone. Don't go on the internet. Don't use your phone, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Even though there's no evidence to support any of that. Anyway, then what happens is you're still symptomatic. So you go back and you say, well, Hey, what's going on? Maybe they refer you to a neurologist and you go to the neurologist. The neurologist does their little neurology examination and they say, well, you know, you're neurologically intact. Everything is fine. So now you're left on your own and you enter into what I call the concussion care maze. Picture yourself sitting in the middle of a, a round room and there's just all these doors around you. And every single one of those doors could be labeled something else. You have, let's say, vision therapy or neurooptometry. You have vestibular rehab. You have, you know, PT. You have exercise therapy. You have um, occupational therapy and cognitive rehab. And you have, you know, all of these doors are labeled with different potential treatment options that you can do. Now, you open up that door and you enter a hallway. And no matter what, it's going to cost you money to explore whether or not that's going to be the way out of this little room you're sitting in so you're sitting in a room you have a bunch of options around you and really the only strategy you have is to start trying doors so you start opening let's try vision therapy i feel like it's my eyes i'm gonna go and try a little bit of vision therapy right you pay your money you go down that pathway and you get to the end of the hallway and you go to open the door and it's locked you can't get through that doorway so it's not vision therapy, you're still symptomatic, so you have to go back to the main room. You sit back down, you look around, you go, okay, I've heard hyperbaric oxygen, so I'm gonna go down that pathway, right? You open the door, you pay your money, you go down the pathway, you get to the end of the hall, and the doorway is locked. That wasn't it, you come back. So it's all trial and error when it comes to concussion. And patients will spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars just trying random doors, right? Some of them will be locked. Some of them will be complete dead ends. Some of them will be a key, right? You'll get to the end of the hallway and there'll be a little key there. And that opens a lock in one of those other hallways, but you don't know. And the reason why I say that is because you may have an issue where you feel dizzy and off balance, okay? And you'll go do some work on your neck, okay? It won't, it won't completely eliminate it, but you'll pick up something in there that will be helpful later on. So by getting your neck fixed, if you now go and try the vision therapy door, that key will open that lock. And now vision therapy will end up being much more fruitful for you because you fixed the underlying neck issues. So all of your systems work together. Most patients get stuck in this concussion care maze of trying different things and not knowing how to do it in the proper order and what things should be done kind of together, right? You usually try one thing at a time. And what I'm going to try and explain to you in this session is that you need to have a combination of tools at your disposal. So the way that we set this up in the concussion fix program, for example, is that we look at recovery in a concussion recovery pyramid. You have to build the foundation of the pyramid first. If you skip over the foundation of the pyramid, you will fail. Okay. The bottom rung of the pyramid. And if we're watching on YouTube, we're probably showing that image somewhere around me, but Right here at the bottom of the pyramid, you have the mindset, okay? The mental health aspect of concussion recovery. One of the most important pieces to this. Around the mental health piece, you have education, 
right? You have recovery mindset. You have how to deal with hyper arousal of the nervous system, how to calm the nervous system down, how to balance the sympathetic and the parasympathetics together, right? How to deal with setbacks because recovery is going to be difficult. You're going to have to do a bunch of things that are going to challenge you symptomatically. They're going to create all sorts of, you know, symptoms for you. And how are you going to deal with that? Okay. Are you going to be able to um, you know, overcome that or are you going to crumble in that? So you have to be able to learn how to deal with setbacks, how to have a growth mindset and how to reduce the stress. Once you've conquered the bottom rung of that pyramid, now you can move into the next tier. The next tier is all about inflammation, healing the gut, uh, ha handling your sleep, regulating your hormones, uh, dealing with blood flow, fixing your diet and nutrition, getting supplements to help kind of offset or augment some of these things. And then finally, after you've got your foundation set, which is those two pieces, the mindset and the inflammatory piece, once you've dealt with those, now you can go up into the rehab section. Most patients make the mistake of going right to rehab. Rehab won't work if your nervous system is out of whack. If you're dealing with a sympathetic overload, and you try to go and do rehab, you're going to get all discombobulated. It's not going to work. So you're going to think that, well, vestibular rehab doesn't work for me. That's not necessarily the case. You didn't get the key first. You went right to the end of the door and it was locked and you didn't have the right key. If you had built your foundation first, maybe it would have been helpful. So you have to think about it in this way. You can't just start trying doors. You need to sit down and pick up a map and go through the process of going, okay, if I still have persistent symptoms, that means that something may have been already impaired before my injury. And this has exacerbated it, right? I may have had issues with mindset. It may have been mental health. I may have had pre-existing anxiety, depression. Maybe the injury created some PTSD and that PTSD is a barrier now to me recovering. Okay. So you have to deal with that element. That's very hard to deal with that. But if you don't, it's going to always be there just poking you and pulling you back. All right, so that's number one. Once you have that set, you're like, okay, I've, I'm dealing with these issues. I'm working on this every day. I'm developing practices to kind of continue to, to grow and work through these issues. Now I'm going to deal with inflammation in my body, right? The foods that we eat, especially in North America are terrible. Okay. The American North American diet is brutal for our nervous systems. It creates more imbalance. It messes with our guts. We have food sensitivities, chronic inflammation that affects us from all levels. Okay. And if we don't deal with that and regulate that, then also rehab is not going to work. I'll use the example of manual therapy, right? If you have an issue with your neck and somebody's treating your neck, but you have so much inflammation in your body, you can't recover well from that treatment. And that's going to exacerbate things. It's going to make it worse. And the tissue is not going to respond to that treatment. And so it's not going to work. So again, you have to do things in this order. You have to deal with the big problems first. And uh, okay, so let's dive in. All right. Causes of PCS, we have autonomic dysregulation. As I mentioned last week, we have sympathetic dominance. So you have two sides of your autonomic nervous system. You have your sympathetic system, which is your fight or flight. Then you have your parasympathetic system, which is your rest and digest. Okay. This can cause blood flow impairments, digestive issues, increased anxiety and stress, sleep problems, hormone imbalances, and cognitive problems. How do we fix it? If we have a high sympathetic and a low parasympathetic, these things work on a teeter totter. So the only way to bring sympathetic down is to raise parasympathetic up. So if we can raise the parasympathetic side, we can actually lower the sympathetic side. Okay. All of our parasympathetic nervous system is mostly mediated through a nerve called the vagus nerve. And that is the nerve that it's called the wanderer. It kind of goes everywhere throughout our body and affects all sorts of things like digestion, right? It's the rest and digest. So it does things that allow us to kind of calm things down, right? It, it slows down our breathing. It slows down our heart rate. It improves our digestion. Um, whereas on the sympathetic side, it increases our heart rate. It shuts off our digestion. It does all these things. So we want to do things to raise our parasympathetic nervous system. So things like breathing, deep breathing techniques can raise the parasympathetic system because it, the diaphragm is very connected with the vagus nerve. So by doing deep breathing type exercises, we can 
um, stimulate the vagus nerve and we can improve its function. Um, diet, right? Digestion, very correlated with the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. Mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques, right? Meditation and mindfulness can do this as well. Um, working on our sleep, uh, aerobic exercise. And in fact, aerobic exercise is probably one of the most evidence-based treatments for concussion right now. The treatment for concussion used to be like, don't do anything, rest, do nothing, stay in bed. And now we find that the early evidence on exercise found that it was really beneficial for patients with persistent symptoms. And now we're finding that it works even in the acute stages. Aerobic exercise improves neuronal function, cortical connectivity, so connections within the brain, blood flow to the brain, autonomic nervous system regulation, so the balance of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, and brain healing modulators, so different molecules within your brain that help it to heal from injury. And exercise can be started as early as five to 10 days after injury. Researchers at the University of Buffalo have kind of pioneered this. They started publishing work in 2006 and seven on this particular topic about regulating the autonomic nervous system through exercise. And they've shown a bunch of evidence since then. So a study done in 2012 returned to full functioning after graded exercise assessment and progressive exercise treatment of post-concussion syndrome, they found that 72% of patients with chronic concussion symptoms, 72% of them recovered within an eight to 12 week exercise program, okay? Another one, exercise treatment for post-concussion syndrome. They did a pilot study that found that an exercise versus stretching trial, so they randomly separated the group, half got exercise, half got a stretching uh, exercise program. The group that was doing cardio-based exercise showed changes on their fMRI. They showed changes in blood flow in the brain just by doing exercise, all right? And exercise was so um, strong in terms of evidence that it actually made it into the Berlin consensus statement. So exercise is one way to do this. We're finding that even in the acute stages, for every day that you delay the initiation of exercise after a concussion injury, there is a increased chance that you will have persistent symptoms. So isn't that wild? And yet we still, in our medical system, have people telling patients to rest and do nothing. The evidence shows that for the first day or two, you wanna kinda of take it easy, but after that, you should be starting to do exercise. Even in those first couple of days, you should be going on walks, okay? And then after that, you should be gradually progressing that exercise. There was a recent or a recent uh, randomized control trial done in 2021 by John Letty, who's at the University of Buffalo. This was, was just published a couple weeks ago in The Lancet, Child and Adolescent Health. They had 118 adolescents who were seen within 10 days of their injury, and they were randomly assigned to daily uh, exercise programs of 20 minutes long. So they either got the subsymptom threshold cardio exercise, or they got a stretching protocol, which was considered the placebo. The exercise group after four weeks was 50% less likely. So these are acute patients within the first 10 days of injury. They're given an exercise program. 50% less likely to go on to have persistent symptoms than those in the placebo group. Overall, the balance of evidence shows that there is grade B evidence to support early controlled aerobic exercise uh, after concussion with little to no harm. So exercise, good. Okay. Number two, inflammation and hormones. The number one thing for this is fixing the gut and the diet. Okay. And they kind of go hand in hand. All right. Brain injury causes increased gut permeability. So foods that never used to be an issue for you could all of a sudden be an issue for you, right? People can develop gluten intolerances and dairy issues and all sorts of things. Foods that you've eaten for your whole life all of a sudden become problematic for you. A lot of concussion patients will come in complaining of stomach pains and uh, you know their gut is irritated after concussion injury. Irritation of the gut causes inflammation in the body. That inflammation, it also affects um, the inflammatory markers that, that end up in your brain, and it also affects the neurotransmitters that are produced in your gut, okay? So gut issues are related to mental health, depression, anxiety, um, all sorts of things, okay? So it's very important to look at our diets and what we're eating, right? Processed foods, fried foods, high inflammatory, 
high carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates and sugars, all of these things are pro-inflammatory, right? Even in a normal healthy situation, they're pro-inflammatory. Now, if you have a situation where you've increased gut permeability and you also have a sympathetic drive, which has decreased gut motility and have impaired our digestion, this stuff sits there for longer and actually creates a kind of a bit of a, a cyclical effect and makes things even worse. So this is called the gut brain axis, which is also mediated by the vagus nerve. Okay, so this, this is how things tie in. This is what I mean. You can't just do breathing exercises and think it's going to work. You have to do the breathing exercises with the mental health, with the exercise, with the diet, with the gut repair, etc. Okay, so everything has to be kind of working together. So on the diet side, I have a paper here called The Western Diet Aggravates Neuronal Insult in Post-Traumatic Brain Injury. And then they basically took all the evidence and came up with proposed pathways for this. So you can see you have upregulation in a lot of the pathways like mTOR pathways. Uh, you, have, um, you have activation of the hypothalamus, which is connected to the pituitary and involved in hormone production. So this is how your diet affects your hormones. We know that after concussion injury, you have reductions in growth hormone, reductions in testosterone, issues with increased cortisol and other stress-related hormones related to sympathetic overdrive and sleep problems, okay? So everything is connected and we kind of have to look at this and build the foundation of our pyramid. If we're not going to if we're not going to affect change in those areas, we're going to have a very difficult time in recovering. So I'm throwing up a couple other studies here. The American Medical Society Position Statement for Sports Medicine on Concussion, uh, 2018. They found there is emerging evidence in animal models of concussion that some supplements may protect or speed recovery from concussion, specifically focused on certain B vitamins, omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin D, progesterone, uh, and methyl diaspartate, exogenous ketones, and dietary manipulations. Example, ketogenic diet. So there's some preliminary evidence, at least in animals, on ketogenic diet being helpful for concussion recovery. And that is likely more of a reflection, at least in our opinion, because we don't tend to su subscribe to a ketogenic diet. We tend to subscribe more to an anti-inflammatory diet. But the ketogenic diet is because you've removed carbohydrates from the diet. And a lot of times carbohydrates that people eat are very pro-inflammatory, right? Refined sugars, refined grains, you know, things like rice and gluten. They're, they're pro-inflammatory. So just by going ketogenic, it may not necessarily be the fat content of the diet in this particular case, but actually the reduction in inflammatory markers. Okay, so in our concussion fix program, we tend, uh, Dr. Herkel has made our diet, we tend to go with a, um, a more holistic diet in terms of trying to reduce inflammation, repair the gut, improve sleep, regulate hormones, um, and other, you know, autonomic nervous system regulators. And so we call this the concussion fix diet. So this is a mainstay of the concussion fix program. And in that we teach patients kind of what it is, how to do it, right? So the concussion fix is designed to be a step-by-step -step process for building that foundation. And part of that is controlling the inflammation. And so if you need help with this, check out the concussion fix. Actually, the link is in my Instagram bio, and we'll put it in the show notes as well for people that are interested in in that. So um, you are what you eat. And I'm going to kind of just end that part here. Your cells are literally composed of the building blocks that you give it, right? You can't build a strong house without strong materials. And that's the same thing that goes for your cells, your body, your function. Okay. Sleep. I'm just throwing up a study here on sleep, basically showing that those with poor sleep quality tend to do better because or tend to do worse. Sleep is how we clear inflammation at night. So if we're not getting into a good deep sleep and we're not getting the right amount of sleep, you know, when you have a bad sleep, you kind of wake up and your head feels foggy and you're not able to concentrate. You're just, you have so much inflammation because you weren't able to clear it. Okay. So sleep is a big way in which we clear inflammation. If we're not getting good sleep, then we're not going to be able to clear that inflammation and we're going to end up with, you know, chronic problems. Hormones, 35 to 50% of people after concussion have uh, growth hormone deficiencies and hypopituitarism, meaning low pituitary function after concussion injuries. Oftentimes, these can be resolved naturally just by doing the diet, the sleep, the exercise, uh, you know, the gut repair, 
excuse me, all of those things, sometimes you may need hormone replacement therapy. You may need to kind of go that extra step. But what we always do is we try to do it in a natural way first to regulate it. And then we look at, okay, how can we supplement this in addition? Okay. So that's another element to tackle is the hormones. All right. Tackling the third cause of persistent symptoms, visual and vestibular, it's often difficult to figure out what is your visual system and what is your vestibular system. Often, you're, if your eyes feel weird and off, you think, oh, it's my eyes, and you go to your optometrist and they say, well, your eyes are normal, or you go to a neuro-optometrist and say, oh, you got some movement issues here, and we're going to give you a bunch of exercises. What they often don't understand and what people don't take into account a lot of, in a lot of ways is the fact that your eyes are very much uh, attuned with your vestibular system. So if your vestibular system is dysfunctional, your eye movement is gonna be disordered. If your neck is dysfunctional, your eye movement is gonna be disordered. So a lot of times patients with visual problems will actually be suffering from a neck issue. So again, getting neck treatment done simultaneously with vision therapy and vestibular therapy is going to be most effective. You have the triangle here. These three systems work together. You have vision therapy, vestibular therapy, and, and treatment of the neck. If you're just going to tackle one end of that pyramid one at a time, which is what a lot of people do, oh, I'm going to try vestibular first and see how that goes. Okay, most of the time it's not going to work. And in fact, I have a study uh, right here that shows that across the majority of outcomes, even people with vestibular, or sorry, with dizziness, Patients with dizziness as their primary complaint after concussion, only 50% of the time is vestibular therapy helpful, okay? People with dizziness, and you would assume that vestibular therapy is, is for dizziness, people with dizziness post-concussion, only 50% of the time will it be effective for people with concussion. So somebody comment here, vestibular therapy is really helpful for my concussion. That, again, this is one person who, if you have, if you have a, a set vestibular problem, vestibular therapy may be helpful. But 50% of the time, it's not. And it's not because you don't have necessarily a vestibular problem. But you may have other commingling problems that you're not addressing. And this is where people go wrong. So it's not that vestibular therapy wasn't effective. It's not that vision therapy wasn't effective. It's not that treatment of your neck wasn't effective. But you may have just been doing them not together. And if you're not going to do them together then you're missing out potentially on some of the benefit. But the treatment for this is rehabilitation. Okay, so the treatment for vestibular issues is mostly rehab. So you can find yourself a vestibular therapist, but what I would even recommend further is find yourself a concussion trained PT or Cairo or AT or OT. Somebody that does rehab for those three systems. Okay, if you're just gonna go straight vestibular, they are potentially gonna miss it. And the problem is a lot of times vestibular therapists think that they treat concussions, right? They treat small portions of concussions, those with only vestibular issues, but they're missing a whole pile. So a better option is to go to a concussion trained therapist because they'll look at it in that lens. Of, could be vestibular, could be neck, could be vision, but we're gonna tackle all three simultaneously and we're gonna get the best bang for our buck. So that's how you do it. That's the best way to do it. Vision therapy, is a little bit controversial to be honest and there's more evidence starting to emerge on vision therapy vision therapy unfortunately was actually left off of the most recent consensus statement so i'm interested to see next year when they redo the consensus statement which has changed uh, dates and venues a few times now um, but next year during the consensus statement it's gonna be interesting to see if vision therapy makes it on it's kind of a controversial thing people a lot of times don't think that it's effective. There's evidence now showing that vision therapy is effective, but whether or not it's enough evidence to push it over the consensus statement line, um, uh, we don't know. Now, we tend to refer a lot of patients to neurooptometry, right? But again, the neurooptometrists that we work with will have a collaborative system in place. They will, they will understand that neck is involved. They will understand that vestibular is involved. And they will understand that vision is one portion of it. So there are papers that show that vision therapy is effective for, um, for concussion issues. But usually it needs to be done with a whole bunch of things. Uh, I see questions over here on, on the gram, so I will get to those at the end, I promise. Okay, 
Neck dysfunction, again, like I said in last week, you have overlap with all the symptoms. The mechanism of injury is the same. It's a it's a acceleration injury. Concussion is a 70 to 120 Gs of acceleration. Whiplash is only four Gs of acceleration. So there's a big discrepancy. If you've got a concussion, you for sure have some sort of whiplash mechanism that happens at the same time. The symptoms are literally identical. If we put them side by side, they are the same. And so how do you know that just because you have a headache, you think it's due to your concussion, but it's actually likely due to some of the tissues in your neck. So a headache that comes from your neck is called a cervicogenic headache, okay? It means coming from your neck. Uh, this has been studied a lot by an author named Bogduck, and what they define it as referred pain perceived in any region of the head caused by a primary pain source that is not within the head, but innervated by the neck muscles, okay? So generally this is on one side of the head, tends to be on the same side, like, oh, I have this left eye thing. You can have it on both sides, but sometimes most people will feel it like, oh, it's like right here, I feel this, I feel this pain, okay? You could be associated with nauseousness, could be associated with vomiting, could be associated with dizziness, could be associated with light and noise sensitivity, could be associated with blurred vision um, on the eye on the side that's affected. Now, a lot of this is mediated through an area of the brain stem called the trigeminal cervical nucleus. Your trigeminal nerve supplies sensation to your face. The trigeminal cervical nucleus is in your brain stem, and it overlaps just by where it is by the nerves that bring pain and temperature sensation from the neck. So if you have pain and temperature sensation coming from the neck and you have painful spots on your neck and they interact with that area in the brainstem, you might perceive it as pain in the face, forehead, eye, jaw, but it's actually issues with your neck, but it's a trick that your nervous system can play, right? So by tr trying to find where this is, it's actually in your neck somewhere. And so if you treat that area and you disrupt the pain sensation coming in from the neck, it no longer interacts with that and you can actually reduce pain in those areas. There's also a thing called referred pain. So if you push on a muscle, that has trigger points or tenderness, it can cause pain to be felt elsewhere. So patients will come in, so suboccipitals is a big one. There are these muscles right in the back of the neck, like right in the little groove up in the base of your skull. And I'll get you guys to do a little exercise right now. So if you take two fingers like this and you put them in that little kind of pocket at the base of your neck, and you just look side to side with your eyes. Just move your eyes side to side. And if you feel what you'll feel is little twitches underneath your fingers, okay? Those are the muscles of your upper neck that move when your eyes move. The suboccipital muscles are the most kind of um, connected of all of these muscles, but they're connected to eye movement because the way your nervous system works is if your eyes are gonna go right, your neck is gonna go right at the same time because let's say there's something over there, you wanna turn and look at the same time. It's a protective mechanism. So now let's think back. If our eyes are moving around and those muscles are firing as our eyes are moving, well, if you have dysfunction in these muscles or in the upper part of your neck, it can start to refer pain and you start to feel it somewhere else. The referred pain points for the suboccipitals are on the sides of the head, the forehead, and right behind the eyes. So sometimes patients will come in and be like, I have this headache and it's right behind my eye. I've been to the eye doctor. I've been to a neurologist. I've been, no one can figure it out. I've had imaging done. I've had whatever. Immediately I'm going, this guy has a suboccipital problem. And you push in there and they go, oh yeah, oh, oh geez, there it is. Because they think it's here, but it's not. It's a trick that your brain is playing on you. It's a, called a referred pain. Suboccipitals are common. I'm showing an image right now of the SCM. The SCM is this big, fat guy here, right? The big muscle in your neck that if you put resistance on it, it's right here. The SCM muscle is involved in rotation. And when you rotate, if that muscle is tight, it can make you feel dizzy, okay? It also affects how your eyes move. And it refers pain into the face, into the forehead, behind the eye, around the side of the head, on top of the head, to behind the ear. The SCM refers pain to a lot of different places. So if it's tight and jacked up, you might feel that you have this headache but it's actually just this muscle that needs to be worked out, okay? So the treatment is manual therapy and rehabilitation. I'm showing here an excerpt of a paper that I wrote called The Role of the Cervical Spine in Post-Concussion Syndrome. I did a paper uh, with actually John Letty at the University of Buffalo on this particular topic, and we treated patients with persistent concussion symptoms. We just treated their necks, and we had 
all of them get better. Okay, so this is a super important thing. I'm showing another paper here by Jensen from 1990. This is an old school paper, 1990, this paper came out. It was a randomized control trial where they had patients who were suffering from headaches, at least one headache per day for the past year. Okay, one headache per day for the past year. Half of them got manual therapy, working on their neck with their hands, right? Treating the muscles and tissues of their neck. The other half were just given ice packs and told them to place them on their neck. And what you see after two treatments, there is a 60% reduction in headache pain after only two treatments in the group that was getting manual therapy, whereas the group that was just getting cold packs just stayed level, there was nothing. 60% reduction, and that maintained for weeks after. So treatment for neck related issues, manual therapy, but also for rehab. Manual therapy also works for cervicogenic dizziness. So the muscles of your neck tell you where you are in space. If you have tightness in one side and not the other, that can make you feel like you're turned. That can make you feel like you're getting pulled to one side. That can make you feel like you're walking on unstable ground, or it can make your eyes feel weird, like everything around you is very strange, okay? So, what works best in all this? Well, like I said, manual therapy and rehabilitation, but what works even better is combining therapies. There was a paper done in 2014 by Katherine Schneider at the University of Calgary where they did a randomized control trial and they did what's called cervical vestibular rehabilitation. So not just doing vestibular and not just doing neck, but combining cervical and neck, okay? so. There was a group, so there's, there's a patient coming in, 31 patients that were still symptomatic 10 days after injury. They separated them half. Half of them got just the standard care, which at that time was kind of rest and do nothing, and when you're asymptomatic, you kind of go through the proper return to sport protocol. Then the other half got that same thing, but they also got rehab, okay? They got rehab one time per week for eight weeks. After eight weeks of treatment, 73% of those in the group that were getting treatment had fully cleared to return to play versus only 7% of those that were in the other group. So basically 10 times better, right? When you're getting treatment, okay? Another one, did another randomized control trial on early treatment for dizziness. Group one got treatment. They got manual therapy of the neck, vestibular rehab, ocular motor rehab, and neuromotor retraining. Group two was also given rehab, but it was what's called subtherapeutic. So they were given exercises, but they weren't challenged. They were given really easy things to do. All subjects were seen two times a week for a max of eight visits or until they were cleared to return to play by a sports medicine physician. The experimental group, the one that was getting all the treatment, recovered two times faster and was cleared to return to sport three times faster than those who weren't. Now, even if you look at the Berlin consensus statement from a few years ago, and this is the guiding document around the world, treatment should be individualized and target specific medical, physical, and psychosocial factors identified on assessment. There is preliminary evidence supporting the use of individualized sub-symptom uh, threshold aerobic exercise program in patients with persistent post-concussion symptoms associated with autonomic instability or physical deconditioning, and B, a targeted physical therapy program in patients with cervical spine or vestibular dysfunction, and C, a collaborative approach including cognitive behavioral therapy to deal with any persistent mood or behavioral issues, which leads us now to finally the psychological intervention. I talk about this last, but I actually implement it first. Remember my pyramid. The bottom of the pyramid is the mindset, okay? The education, the balancing of the nervous systems, the, the you know growth mindset, the stress reduction techniques. The next up is the inflammatory gut, um, you know, exercise, you know, again, a bit of autonomic dysregulation stuff. And then finally is rehab. Okay. So I talk about psychological last, but I implement it first. So number one, education and reassurance. Education and reassurance is found to be one of the best ways to reduce concussion uh, symptoms. In fact, in the concussion fix program, after the first two weeks, the average symptom reduction, the average symptom reduction is 50%, okay? 50% of people's symptoms go away after the first two weeks just because they've gone through the educational piece. The first part of our program is just the education. That's step one. Step two is now we're into the bottom rung of the pyramid, which is the mindset piece. So by two weeks, they're basically just starting into mindset, 50% reduction in symptoms. So literally half the battle is just understanding your condition. And when you understand it, 
right? We fear what we don't understand, and as soon as we understand it, we can conquer it. Cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a type of psychotherapeutic intervention which focuses on challenging and changing our cognitive distortions and behaviors, improving our emotional regulation, and the development of personal coping strategies. One of the big drawbacks for concussion recovery is coping strategies. Those that are um, you know, very adaptive copers tend to do better. Those that are not tend to do worse. So changing your coping strategies or helping to benefit or improve your coping strategies can be very helpful. So cognitive behavioral therapy has been shown to be helpful in improving cognitive outcomes as well. People that have memory impairments and all these other things, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, but all of that, or not all of that, but a lot of that is related to mental health issues. And so it's been shown to be helpful in improving cognitive outcomes. It's also effective at reducing symptoms in children. A recent review from Elmer in 2021, clinical bottom line, based on the results of this critically appraised topic, there is moderate evidence to support the use of CBT as a treatment intervention to reduce complaints of persistent concussion symptoms in children and adolescents. Mindfulness. Mindfulness practice decreases default mode interference. I talked about default mode interference last week. So go check that out. And why would that be important? If you understand that, you will understand why mindfulness can be effective to shut that down. Increased self-efficacy. And again, coping strategies. Coping strategies are huge. And increasing attention, right? A lot of people will have issues with attention following concussion injury. Mindfulness-based stress reduction helps to improve attention abilities. So there's there's the mainstay treatments for concussion, the main evidence-based treatments. Things notice how I didn't mention laser therapy. Notice how I didn't mention um, you know any type of hyperbaric oxygen therapy or any type of thing where you need a machine. You don't need to get a spec scan to do all this fancy stuff and spend ten thousand dollars to go somewhere for a week. No, you just need to have some direction and to be able to put this stuff in place step by step. Day in, day out. Follow the pyramid. Go step by step. Sit down in the middle of that room with all those doors and pick up a map. Okay? Don't just start trying doors. And unfortunately, that's what most people do. And that's where you're going to waste all your money. Okay? So sit down and take a look at it from a step by step process. If you need help with this, check out our concussion fix program. If you're already at the point where you need rehab, check out completeconcussions.com because these are concussion trained people that do everything together. Now, I want to make one honorable mention because I know that people are going to ask me questions about this. One honorable mention is cognitive rehabilitation. So, I mentioned vestibular rehab, visual rehab and all of these things that deal with that deal with physical symptoms. But what about cognitive symptoms? What about my memory, my focus, my attention, my foggy feelings, all of this stuff? The problem is there is not a ton of evidence on this particular topic, but it is starting to gain some strength. Here's the issue when it comes to cognitive rehab is that cognitive problems are sometimes not cognitive problems. There's a major psych overlay with this. There's a misattribution of symptoms. Now I'm showing a study here that was done. This was published in the Toronto Star and it says study on former NHL players and concussions yields surprising early results. In a new study done by Toronto researchers, ex-NHL players showed no significant cognitive impairment, regardless of how many concussions they'd suffered. But the findings don't match how some players say they feel. Because our minds can trick us into thinking all sorts of things. So things like memory is subjective. Oh, my memory just isn't as sharp since my concussion. But what starts to happen in concussion patients is that everything you think starts to present itself and become your reality. If you think you have a memory impairment, you will find every little thing throughout your day that leads you to believe that, yes, I have a memory impairment. Walk into a room, forget why you came in there. That happens to me every day. But if I had a concussion, I would walk in and go, man, I can't, I just can't think anymore because of my concussion. So you see how you start to attribute everyday normal things to concussion injury. And this starts to make you think that you have a memory impairment, right? You introduce yourself to somebody, they tell you your name within five seconds. You're like, damn, what's that guy's name again? Again, I'm not great with names. Happens to me all the time, but I have no concussion. So I'm not even thinking that, but somebody with a concussion starts to think that that is a reflection of memory impairment and it's not. So oftentimes cognitive problems, and I learned this also from a neuropsychologist that I work with closely, when we would send them patients for this, he would say, honestly, the majority of time, all these people test normal. 
they have no cognitive impairment whatsoever, but they think they do. So what I always tell patients is if you think you have a cognitive problem, the first thing you need to do is actually get tested on this. You need objective testing to see is there a cognitive problem or is there not? And the majority of times, there's likely to not be a cognitive problem. And so a lot of times people undergoing cognitive treatment are doing it without necessarily having any cognitive issues. So it's important to consider that. Now, I have a study that I've just shown up here. Change in self-reported cognitive symptoms after mild traumatic brain injury is associated with changes in emotional and somatic symptoms and not changes in cognitive performance. Basically, what they did is they looked at people whose cognitive impairment changed over time in terms of their subjectiveness, but they found that people that reported that they had cognitive impairments tested normal. The only thing that changed in that meantime where they had cognitive impairment was that their emotional status changed or they had more symptoms. So if you have more symptoms or you have more emotional symptoms, you start to have more cognitive problems. So a lot of times cognitive problems, in my experience, will sort themselves out. If I can get rid of your headaches, generally you start to have okay cognitive issues, right? If I can get rid of your dizziness, your memory starts to improve. If I can make you feel better, you know, emotionally by giving you education or sending you over to psychotherapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, your cognition starts to improve. So the only way to know if you think you have cognitive problems, the only way to know is to actually get cognitive testing, but you also just want to deal with everything else. So the best strategy here is to tackle the other elements first, right? all the ones I talked about, most of the time cognitive problems will go away. If they're still there, step two is to actually go and get tested. Do I actually have cognitive problems or is this something else? If there are cognitive problems, then you can start looking into OT, neuropsychology, uh, speech language pathologists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? There isn't a lot of evidence yet on cognitive rehabilitation, but for those people that have true cognitive issues, there is mounting evidence that it could be a helpful thing to pursue. Now, I have an OT coming on uh, a few times this year, actually, during this podcast season, and her and I are going to talk all about uh, cognitive problems, and I know that she listens to this, so hey, Jenny. Um and we'll, we'll talk more about that. But that is kind of the state of the evidence. And I know that because she specializes in this and cognitive issues, I'm sure that her and I were going to have a great chat about uh, this particular topic. And I'm really looking forward to it. So that is it for that. So the summary, best treatments. Here we go. Okay, we ready? Psychological intervention, mindfulness, etc. Dealing with the mental health. That is the basis for my treatment. Also educating yourself on this. Number two, inflammation hormones, okay? Doing things that control that. Diet, sleep, exercise, uh, again, mindset stuff, um, et cetera, et cetera. Then finally on that, it's rehabilitation. So visual, vestibular, neck, and cognitive rehab in the event that you have ongoing cognitive problems that weren't addressed by tackling all of those other things, okay? Whew. That was a lot. And, uh, you know, thank you guys for listening and hopefully that was helpful for you guys. Uh, if you want more guidance on this, again, you can check out the Concussion Fix program. If you go to concussiondoc.io, uh, you'll see the Concussion Fix program there. Uh, it's been really, really helpful. We've had probably 1,500 people now come through it and, um, and it's been really, really helpful in helping people get back to work and back to life and everything like that. And it really just kind of does all of this stuff and it's not a fancy thing. You don't need the fancy stuff. You just need some guidance and just to spend the time on it okay so that's it for me i will see you guys next week i hope you enjoyed it